Get that thing out of the picture. Huh? <laughs> All right. If I well, set it over there, is it out of the picture? Yep, I think you're clear. Okay. What um, I don't want to do. Who, who was the guy that was reaching for water? And he was giving that long speech. It was after one of the. Oh, Marco Rubio. Yes. I don't think you can do that with hot coffee. <laughs> don't touch it, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started for um, November, but uh, September's production information. And I don't think I have any updates. Otherwise, um, in the next week or so, please keep an eye out for director's cut dates that'll come out for 2021. Um, keeping in mind, those are slightly tentative if we have to move them for um, various events or other things, but hoping to get that out in a couple weeks. So otherwise I'll send it over to Lynn. Thanks, Katie. Uh, as Katie indicated, we're talking September numbers here. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about the numbers a little bit. Just a reminder, Industrial Commission meeting Monday. So uh, this coming Monday, there will be some activity uh, in many of these areas. And, you know, one of the things we'll be talking about is next year's hearing schedule, as well as uh, we'll be talking about uh, pre-filed legislation. So you might find some of that interesting. What what we're talking about from an agency standpoint in terms of legislation that we want to pre-file. Um, constantly have to remind you that all our rowdy friends are coming to town in about six weeks. So. <laughs> so um, with that, we'll get to the numbers. September production was up uh, 5% on the oil side. So good news there. Um, I think uh, that this may be the, the last month of production increase, but we shall see. Uh, completions are not keeping pace with the natural decline. Uh, as you see in the report, uh, only 43 completions and uh, we need in the neighborhood of 70, 60 to 70 to keep up with the natural declines. And the uh, return to production business has just about played itself out. Uh, our best estimate as of last Friday was that there's less than 60,000 barrels a day uh, shut in you know, because of the low prices or still shut in uh, as a result of the uh, COVID pandemic. So there's, there's little to no production uh, to be brought on from that standpoint and the completions are not keeping pace with the natural decline. Uh, so this may be uh, about as good as it gets for a while. It's possible uh, that October could be a slight bump from this, uh, but it's not going to be a, a big increase. 7% increase in natural gas production. So uh, we've returned to that paradigm of uh, as we bring new wells on uh, gas numbers grow faster than oil numbers. The great news is that uh, the infrastructure got built, the infrastructure's there, and even with the 7% increase in natural gas production, uh, gas capture statewide went to 93% and in the Bakken to 94%. So we're very, very happy with that number. And uh, um, as things go on, construction has continued uh, on what what I call the outrigger plant up west of Williston uh, in Williams County uh, that's going to have a 70 mile gathering pipeline associated with it and it's going to add initially 250 million cubic feet a day uh, of capacity. So we're we're excited to be in those 90s and, and it looks like infrastructure is being built that's going to allow us to stay there. Um, Permitting, well permitting has been uh, surprisingly steady. And so we're seeing in the neighborhood of three permits a day uh, show up in the office, anywhere from three to four. And we're able to process all those within 30 days, our, our typical average. And so as you saw, um, August and September were, were about equal in the 47, 50 range. October jumped up to 74 permits uh, that were issued. And so we're seeing a, a steady stream of permits from the oil and gas operators. Part of that 
uh, you can see reflected in the rig count. Uh, rig count is up uh, a bit in October and even today that is held. We, we have uh, 14 rigs operating. Now one of those is drilling a saltwater disposal well and one is still uh, finishing up a carbon storage well up here in McLean County. So 12 in oil and gas, but that that represents a 20% increase from the low point. That is attributed to fear of changing federal policy. Uh, the economics aren't there to be drilling new wells and, and having them sit uh, non-completed, uh, but the potential of the, the inability to renew a federal drilling permit or to get a federal drilling permit is out there. And I'll, I'll talk about some statistics there. If you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to digress to that right now. <laughs> um, when you look at North Dakota, uh, the oil and gas producing area of North Dakota, uh, we've got 7,000 drilling spacing units uh, for Bakken and Three Forks in Western North Dakota. 3,370 of those contain federal minerals. So that means that 48% of all of our spacing units have some amount of federal minerals under them. And uh, typically any well bore that penetrates federal minerals has to get a federal drilling permit. So if there is a moratorium on new federal drilling permits, there's the potential there to impact 48% of our spacing units going forward. And, uh, and there are future wells to be drilled in, in every spacing. None of the spacing units in North Dakota is fully developed at this point. So um, that's the concern. Um, about 26% of those, uh, 1,800 of those spacing units, the feds own less than 50% of the federal minerals. So again, uh, that, that tells you that in the other 22%, they own more than 50% of the minerals. So at least roughly a fourth of the spacing units in North Dakota would be seriously impacted by a moratorium on federal drilling permits is, is kind of what's driving that. Another interesting aspect is that 42% uh, of the spacing units or 42% of where, where the feds own minerals it's a split estate. They own the minerals, but they don't own the surface. But their control over things is twofold. Uh, if they control the surface, then you see the Forest Service or the Army Corps uh, or the BLM or the Bureau of Reclamation getting involved in the NEPA process. But even if they don't own the surface, you have to get a federal permit uh, from the Bureau of Land Management to penetrate federal minerals. So um, even in situations where you have private surface, there's a significant amount of federal minerals that could negatively impact future drilling in North Dakota. So uh, just to kind of sum all that up, 25% of all of our spacing units are 50% or more federal minerals and would be severely impacted by a moratorium. Um, 48% contain some and will be impacted to some extent. Now, you know, I got to admit, in some cases, it's like 10 acres in a spacing unit. And we have the Wyoming case where uh, Judge Scavdall said, no, you can't leverage a rule from the 1980s that said, if there's federal minerals in your spacing unit, you can control the measurement of the oil and gas. Okay, we all went along with that. but. In the previous administration, the Bureau of Land Management tried to leverage that into, hey, we can also control flaring and everything else on the private minerals in that spacing unit. And Judge Scavdall said, no, no, you can't. You can't use that 1986 rule um, that gave you authority over measurement to impose all your other rules and regulations on those private minerals. So I think that's why we're seeing uh, probably uh, two to four more drilling rigs than economics would indicate. And uh, and so we'll see how all that goes. But I anticipated there might be some questions about um, a change in administration and change in policies. And so you can see uh, that even though North Dakota is 
predominantly private surface and minerals, um, there's enough federal to, to really negatively impact uh, future drilling if there is a moratorium on, on drilling permits. So uh, activity on Fort Berthold, uh, pretty steady. And, uh, you know, the unemployment numbers, though, continue to climb out there. So even though we have implemented the Bakken restart, uh, we're now at 11,700 cumulative unemployment claims. And your Bakken core area is the un high unemployment area of the state, close to 11% in Williams County. Uh, and Mackenzie, Mound Trail, and Dunn, I think, are uh, between 5 and 10% unemployment. So, uh, so it is very tough out there, and people are concerned about what they're going to do with their people when the CARES Act project is over. Um, just before I go on to that, uh, I wanted to reemphasize the great news on the gas capture. Uh, to be at 94% in the Bakken is, is fantastic. And the infrastructure continues to be uh, put together to, to hang on to those kind of numbers. So we're, we're very optimistic with that. I'll just close by talking about what we're doing CARES Act wise. So we have confiscated 358 wells and well sites and an additional two sites that are not associated with wells. So 360 sites altogether, but 358 wells. Um, we've plugged 197 of those. So we're well over halfway through the plugging process and uh, that plugging process will continue right up until midnight of December 30th. So they can plug wells in the winter. It just is a little bit slower. And of course, this weather that we have today is fantastic for, for that kind of work. No wind, no snow, no, no rain. So the roads are good. Uh, so that's all going very well. Um, we have uh, initiated the reclamation of 103 uh, sites. We expect to get through 174 before the wind, the weather window closes on us. So uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. But uh, 103 of them are nearly done in terms of reclamation. And want to remind you that next week, 24th, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to host a, a tour for the media to go see reclamation work. So uh, you'll have a chance to get some pictures and uh, talk to some of the people out there, the contractors that are that are doing that work. So uh, hope you can attend. Um, as you know, some of that money was repurposed for completion of duck wells. We have approved 60 grant applications out of the 80 uh, total, and we have 96 applications in the queue. So I think we're going to end up fully subscribing that grant program. Uh, we'll have a better feel here in a, in a couple of weeks of will they spend $200,000 on every well, but I, I think they're assuring me that the water acquisition and storage and transportation and disposal cost is well, well above $200,000 per well. So um, like I said, we've, we've got 96 applications for 80 slots and we've approved 60 of them. So those three projects are, are going extremely well. And, and so we've seen um, the frack crew count now climb up to six and, and we're hoping that, you know, there's another four get added uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, we believe they're available, uh, but that's, you know, whether they can hire people for that short of a short term remains to be seen. And uh, that's all of the direct commentary that I had. So. Any questions? Um, I don't think you touched on this. I just noticed it looked like the inactive well count had gone up by about a thousand. Oh yes, thank you very much. Yes, the inactive well count did uh, jump significantly, and um, I, I too was surprised by that. And those are wells that were shut down uh, within the month between August and September. So they were previous producing wells. The the big increase there was not, you know, new wells being in seed or anything like that. It was wells that were producing in August that then were shut in in September. So I haven't dug into that very deeply. I, I know that they're IA wells, so they're not inactive waivers. They're not temporary abandoned. They're not 
non-completed or duck wells, they are inactive wells. So when I think when we saw the weakness in oil prices, uh, it, you know, we saw WTI get almost to $45 and then drop below 40. Uh, a lot of wells were allowed to, to go idle. So that is going to be a, a concern. That's something we're going to really have to watch because those thousand wells a year from now become abandoned wells. So uh, good question. I have a question that's coming online that's um, more of a, a definition. If you can expand on what a spacing unit is. Oh. Um, we've got some folks who, who maybe want some clarification <laughs> on that. <laughs> yes, so um, my my simple minded explanation of it is it's a box of rocks. Um, so so <laughs> it's typically two square miles. So it, it covers um, it's two miles long and a mile wide and it starts 50 feet above the upper Bakken shale and extends to the base of the Three Forks formation. So a spacing unit is specific to a formation and a geographic area. And so when I, I joke about it being a box of rocks, but it's 400 foot thick roughly uh, and two miles long and, and a mile wide. And so that's a spacing unit and the commission uh, controls how each of, of those is developed. So we have to uh, have a hearing and assign a number of well slots to that uh, box of rocks. And then the, the, that's all the wells that can be permitted and, and drilled in there. We also have what are called setbacks so that we, we keep wells away from the boundaries of that spacing unit so that they don't drain the neighbor's oil. Uh, and then we can allow overlapping spacing units. So we can allow a spacing unit that overlaps too. So some wells can be drilled in, in that area of, of the setbacks. But that all came about uh, as a result of the, the drilling that took place in the 20s and 30s before there was oil and gas regulation. Uh, and if you've ever uh, watched the movie, There Will Be Blood, he talks about that. He always drilled his wells on the boundary into the neighbor's minerals. And he said, if I have a very long straw, I can drink your milkshake. <laughs> so spacing units are set up to keep wells away from those boundaries and away from the, the neighbor's oil so that everybody's corrective rights are protected. So <laughs> it's a big box of rocks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The most common spacing unit is 640 or 1280. 1280, 1280. is the most common. There are variants off of that, uh, but that was found to be the most economic because two mile long wells have the productivity uh, and, and the price that allows North Dakota, um, in some places, wells like that are economic at today's oil price, uh, but in general, they need $55 oil to, to be to be able to develop all the spacing units across North Dakota. But 1280 is by far the most common. Um, I have a, just a question about kind of where you see production headed. So even with the um, grants for the completion work that are happening, would it really just take higher oil prices to actually see production climb at this point? Um, yes, so the question was, um, where do we see oil production headed? And uh, at current prices and even with the incentive program for completing duck wells, uh, the best we can hope for is to, to sustain production above 1.2 million a day, uh, which, which is the goal. Um, we need WTI to get above $45 for completion of duck wells to sustain itself with no incentive. And uh, we need to see probably $55 oil in general to drill new wells and, and complete them. So um, it really is price sensitive. And I, I kind of mentioned that in some of my verbiage, but uh, the current projections of the EIA are that we don't get back to 2019 oil demand till um, not next year, but 2022. So it's more than a year away, maybe a year and a half away before we see demand really come back and and this recent uh, surge in 
COVID cases has has taken a lot of the uh, excitement out of oil prices and, and oil demand recovery. So you said that recovery could Yeah, so the question was a change in administration, a Biden administration, might that take even longer or might it come sooner? And uh, I, I don't think that change in administration is going to really impact uh, to a great extent what happens to oil and gas demand. Uh, the policies that they're talking about um, actually will take longer to implement than than the year and a half to two years until oil demand comes back. However, uh, the policies that they're talking about could could cause sort of a, a bungee effect and actually move prices up uh, more quickly. Because if you take the Gulf of Mexico off the table and you take offshore drilling off the table and you take Alaska and Anwar off the table and 25% and of North Dakota's uh, spacing units now all of a sudden you you don't have a whole bunch of uh, reserves that can be brought on quickly uh, that that are going to keep oil prices down. So it could actually ramp oil prices up more quickly. Yeah. I have a clearing question for you. Um, the new clearing target that takes effect this month does that apply to the numbers that we'll be getting in january which would be november's numbers or does that actually apply to september's numbers that hmm. we're getting today good question yeah so it actually applies to november's numbers that we'll be getting in january yeah so we're well ahead of target uh for september the actual target uh for, to apply to the september production numbers is 88 percent yeah and and it looks really strong. I know uh, Caitlin is looking at a couple of companies that might have production restrictions uh, as a result of their September numbers. So uh, even though we're in great shape statewide, uh, there's a couple of operators that struggle a little bit uh, in September and could end up with some production restrictions. So. Okay, and then the, um, the targets, do they actually apply to the statewide Bakken figure. That's what my editor is Yes, they do. Yeah, they don't apply to statewide. It's, they apply to the statewide Bakken number. Correct. So the gas capture policy and the gas capture order is for Bakken Three Forks or Bakken Pool. That's where the, you know, the problem developed legacy wise. Uh, we were way below 5% flaring. I think when all of this started, we were probably at two and a half percent and pretty consistent there on the on the legacy side uh, the old vertical wells but it was the Bakken that that took us to the 36 percent flaring and so that's the the pools that the goals apply to mm -hmm. question on mine from Mike with the Star Tribune um why did production grow as much as it did in September was it simply the continuance of those shut-in wells coming back online in recent months or are there other reasons Good question, and, and uh, it was very much dominated by wells being returned to production. So that was still a, a big, big part of the activity in September. Uh, but by the end of September, we had less than a thousand wells shut in, and so uh, um, we we're going to see really diminishing returns on that. But yeah, that that is what dominated uh, that production increase. We did actually, uh, I guess, completions wise, um, September was not so hot. Uh, 43, which, which was better than August, uh, but still not enough to offset natural decline. So it, it was wells being put back on production. Got an additional question on mine. Um, the, with the federal permits, you had mentioned that operators are building up an inventory. Um, how long will that? Uh, will they be able to keep drilling before that inventory may run out? So uh, federal permits have a two year life. So if they can get a permit between now and January or between now and when any policy changes, then uh, that permit will be good for two years. So um, I I think that's also why we're seeing, you know, like 74 permits approved in October 
is that uh, they, they are trying to build an inventory of those two year permits. So there again, there, there's going to be a lag here uh, and, and they're going to permit as many wells as, as they possibly can uh, before any policy changes happen. Now those federal permits are expensive though. Um, I think they're $10,000 uh, for a federal permit. What's the state so permit? a big pardon? What's the state permit cost? 100. <laughs> Ours is based on on the cost of issuing a permit. Theirs is based on the cost of operating their whole regulatory compliance department. So they they try to pay through all they try to pay all of it through permitting fees. Can I ask one really awful awful question? <laughs> you talk about Bakken and Three Forks. Is there actually production out of Three Forks? Yeah. Know how much that is. Qu question was: Is is there actually production out of the Three Forks? And yes, absolutely. Off the top of my head, I I can't tell you how the percentage breaks up down, but I think out of our total number of Bakken and Three Forks wells, um, at least a third of them are in the Three Forks formation, not in the Middle Bakken. We'll get you some more solid numbers on that, mm -hmm. but absolutely, the Three Forks is is very productive. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asking because I see statewide block and block and block and block. <laughs> right. And three forks is there. And uh, you referred to three forks. I thought, why not? Let's throw the question out, see what happens. <laughs> yes. And just a, a little bit of trivia for you. It's named after the th Three Forks, Montana, which is where uh, it outcrops. So you can see it on the mountainside out there uh, at Three Forks, which was named by the Lewis and Clark uh, party for where the three rivers come together at the headwaters of the Missouri. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Morgan, go ahead. Um, so we talked about the Bakken and Reef Park trying to get wells back to the area. So then with this CARES Act and these grants going through, is that going to bring wells back in other areas or still just necessarily the Bakken? Um, I, I didn't quite follow the question. So the CARES Act money, is it going to do what? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that happening thus far? Or is it oh, very much so. And so the CARES Act money that we have been spending up to this point uh, has actually gone to the benefit more of uh, Botno, Renville, Burke County, some of the non Bakken counties, because that's where the orphaned wells were. And so um, the about we think in the neighborhood of 1700 jobs some somewhere in that neighborhood uh, that we are supporting at this point with the plugging reclamation those are dominantly in in those counties uh, well I guess McKenzie had a lot of orphan wells too so they those are non Bakken jobs uh, this most recent group the the 60 duck well grants that's going to be focused in in the Bakken core area so you're going to see that in Williams, McKenzie, Dunn, and Mount Trail. Uh, so yeah, that uh, great question. So the plugging and reclamation has created most of its jobs uh, in the northeast part of uh, North Dakota's oil and gas fields, north central North Dakota. The, the duck well program will create its jobs in Williams, McKenzie, and Dunn dominantly. Mm -hmm. I have one more for you. Um, when when you're talking about tasting units, um, specifically the ones that have federal minerals, yes. do you have a sense for, or I guess included in those numbers that you cited, um, would that include trust lands on Fort Berkhold and like, do you have a feel for what percentage that is? Um, it does not include the trust lands. Um, so we, we treat the tribal minerals separately. Uh, and on the tribal side, I don't, do I have that number, Katie? Federally managed. I thought I had it in this email. Um, but that does not include uh, the tribal trust or, or a lot minerals uh, because they're not not considered federal public lands. They are owned uh, by the tribe or the allottees uh, and just managed by the federal government. And we will have to get you a number on that. Uh, but that would be over and above the numbers I already gave you. 
Thank you. suspect again as we start hitting into winter that we won't see any additional uh, gains in, in production in either state we may continue to see those slide down uh, with the lack of drilling and activity in those two other regions when we look at slide three um, this taking a peek at again those month month changes for crude oil and natural gas uh, crude oil production up 56,000 barrels per day You'll see in a few slides uh, what the change was that, that Lynn was alluding to in that shut-in production from August to, uh, to September. Uh, slide four, this is just a quick snapshot of what September was. Um, when I was comparing March production to September production, I was trying to identify which wells uh, were being classified as, as shut-in or severely curtailed, and it was still right around 2,500 wells that got identified and about 158,000 barrels per day. Uh, at least for the whole month of, of September. On slide five, this is that snapshot through time. And if you look at, again, August to September, roughly a 50,000 uh, barrel per day shift. Uh, and so that, I think there was a question that Lynn uh, had fielded about that change from August to September. And I think uh, the data would, would certainly back up Lynn's comments that, again, much of that growth can be attributed to uh, curtailed production coming back online. Slide six in September, the wells that were still were uh, curtailed again from a production as well as a number of well, uh, the well count itself, the Bakken three fork system continuing to dominate that. And as we go forward, we may see that shift as some of these relatively newer, higher performing wells come back online. Uh, it'll be interesting to watch some of those other categories, some of the legacy wells, the vertical uh, Madison and other formations uh, throughout Western North Dakota. Then slide seven, just an update because I've talked about it uh, for a few months now of gas oil ratios. It appears again in September, uh, continuing to, in general, see the gas oil ratios continue to tick up from wells that were curtailed. And so that uh, that is what we suspected was going to happen. Uh, again, just for background, when the curtailed wells were brought back online, we saw a, a significant decrease in gas oil ratios. Concern was whether or not that was going to be a long-term trend, and again, the data is pointing that it is not, and those GORs are back near or above uh, pre-shut-in uh, levels. Slide eight for the, the graphics you see here in a moment. These are just some of the assumptions behind that about number of well completions in the forecast model itself. And then switching gears to the, the crude oil transportation dynamics. Uh, not a whole lot of changes you'll see here in a moment, kind of how it breaks down uh, from August to September. On slide 10, if you look in blue, that is the pipeline market share again, near flat August to September. Uh, crude by rail had a small uptick and we saw a small decrease uh, in uh, refining as well as uh, trucking north into Canada. So, but all in, we did not see major market shifts from the fundamentals of, of Brent pricing, WTI pricing, and then the different pad dynamics. And, and so uh, as expected, things were fairly consistent, at least for the time being. Uh, from a crude by rail perspective, somewhere around 190,000 barrels per day is my, my estimate for where we're at uh, for the month of September. Uh, majority of that uh, continuing to dominate uh, over towards the West Coast pad five uh, refineries in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there was another refinery announcement uh, in, on the East Coast of, of being shut down, uh, PBF, that refinery. So uh, we may continue to see less and less market share going towards the East Coast and continuing to see the West Coast be the dominant destination for crew by rail out of North Dakota. Slide 13 is just a quick update on pricing. Uh, no major uh, uh, 
things that, that stick out uh, again pad one and pad five having the highest priced markets uh, again those are those two areas that uh, we continue to ship crude by rail to and then as we take a snapshot here in the middle of, of november uh, Brent WTI spread just over two dollars and thirty cents. So again, I don't anticipate any major changes. That that still would push barrels, preferably from a marketing standpoint, onto uh, the pipeline network. Barrels that are committed to rail systems have existing contracts and commitments will continue to move by uh, by rail. Uh, but with production levels where they're at, where we expect them in, over the next several months, uh, there should be adequate space on the pipeline network in order to continue to move those barrels primarily either to Cushing or to the Gulf Coast. But this, you know, I'm going to skip over again just to, for folks that are interested in the, the imports, exports on the flaring. Uh, again, great news that, that Lane had already shared about uh, another decrease in the percentages. Uh, where we saw that percentage shift was in the orange or, or wells that were um, already connected and, and flaring. So again, that is good news that uh, not only was there a production increase, but a decrease in the amount of flaring from wells that have pipeline connections. So um, systems, whether that's operational changes, pigging schedules, uh, things, additional compression, and just overall operation of the gathering networks out in the field itself. Uh, again, that's a, a very positive sign. As we get into winter time, again, Mother Nature always has uh, wild cards uh, she'll pull out, um, but hopefully uh, the system is is well positioned to uh, stay ahead of this as we as we head into winter. Slide 17 is again just that historic trend and again it, visually now it, it's very very clear if you look back to mid 2019 now to September 2020 that continual month to month decreases in, in flaring percentages which again is uh, extremely positive. A significant amount of investments been happening over the last couple of years. Uh, four more major projects still in the works uh, for additional processing and gathering uh, infrastructure in the state. So. Again, the industry is not slowing down, um, and, and I can assure you that talking with the midstream companies, they, they certainly want to take advantage of this time to get ahead of it and stay ahead of it uh, going forward. And nine, again, good news. Uh, the new wells selling gas right on par with new wells producing gas, so no, uh, no red flags there. It's always a positive sign. And then pricing, uh, again, where the EIA uh, came out with their short-term uh, November forecast and then again coupled with their their annual long-term forecast again you can see in red uh, where the those outlooks uh, appear to be again no one has a crystal ball but uh, the EIA is uh, one of the, the the best public sources that we have to to rely on for our forecasting and, and pricing metrics so again if you just look at the 55 mark that Lynn had alluded to earlier uh, we're not out there until that mid 2020s time frame and again that $60 isn't out till uh, 2026 2027 type time frame so again uh, month to month as we're looking at the uh, pricing uh, the NYMEX futures things like that we're continuing to see that curve flatten and which is uh, again challenging when when folks are looking at development projects and what activity levels are going to be again with the, the, the drying out of the pandemic itself and some of the, the fundamental shifts on, on the way folks are moving and conducting business, things appear to be uh, lower for longer, uh, which is, uh, again, the trend we've seen for the last number of months. And then on the natural gas uh, gathering and processing side, as I, I mentioned, uh, four additional projects that you can see uh, in green here. The, the infrastructure appears to be, at least in the near term, very well positioned to, to keep pace with uh, the gas capture requirements and the, the needs out in the field itself. Slide 21 again, uh, the infrastructure that is planned today, uh, we're not anticipating that to be adequate for the long term, so we're still looking at what the timing is, what the scale of additional projects in the region uh, for, again, that next set of solutions for the industry to stay ahead of the gas capture requirements in the region. Some major news um, on the northern border uh, pipeline system. Uh, again, I've over the last number of months mentioned uh, tariff filing that was done back in May of this year that would uh, it was proposed to add uh, language which would limit the amount of BTUs uh, exiting North Dakota 
um, on that system. And so at the beginning of November here, uh, the decision was reached by FERC to reject that tariff. Uh, and so uh, right now the that tariff is, is off the table. It's back to uh, the original tariff that was in place before that. So that's continuing to proceed. Um, you know, certainly the, the window was left open by FERC that if additional filings and, and a reattempt uh, by Northern Border was desired, that uh, opportunity is still there. Um, I think right now uh, uh, folks are still kind of digesting the results of that um, decision and looking at what those next steps will be. Uh, when we look at Northern Border, you know, certainly uh, with that ruling and, and a little bit of unknown right now of what the next steps are going to look like, uh, it certainly is not an issue that's going away uh, as far as you know, what does North Dakota do with its um, hotter gas quality in the region. You can see in the last number of weeks, uh, there were some, some days where North Dakota's market share on northern border is over 90%. And so this continues that, that red uh, trend on this graphic is North Dakota's market share on northern border. And so we've gone from a very, very small percentage uh, decades ago to now the dominant shipper on that system. And uh, because our gas quality is different from the Canadian gas that was, uh, again, uh, the, the primary source over the years, um, that has been causing some downstream concerns. And again, when we look at what's happening with the BTU, this was again that, that issue at hand for Northern Border was they have downstream interconnects. Um, let me just quickly show you. Northern Border is the as you head down in Chicago, it's the south of those two yellow lines that you look at. The northern one is Alliance Pipeline, and then just below it is the northern border pipeline. And so downstream, northern border interconnects with a number of other pipeline systems that have upper limits on their pipeline systems of 1,100 or lower. And so as northern border and its shippers and customers on that line continue to watch uh, the, the gas quality shift, uh, again, that was... That was the impetus to cause Northern Border to uh, apply for that tariff change. And, and with that rejection, uh, again, uh, the, the issue is still there and we'll see what the next steps will look like from uh, Northern Border and whether or not they proceed with some type of revised filing here uh, in the near future. So with that, I will be glad to answer any questions. Any questions you did you happen to see there's rumor pipelines right now? Uh, on the crude oil systems, okay. yes. Yep. Um, has line three, the rebuild, which apparently is moving along in a snail space, how will that affect things? Uh, so, so North Dakota's production does not uh, directly enter that, that system. And so um, it shares some of the same market hubs along the Enbridge system. Um, so again, as additional crew were to come down that system, it would provide additional supply into that Great Lakes area, but it's traditionally a heavier grade crude, so not a major market impact, not a capacity impact either that, you know, directly related to it. What's, uh, what's your best guess as to when North Dakota might need more natural gas in the processing infrastructure and things like that to continue to meet our priorities? Yep, so a uh, great question. The question was, you know, what does the timeline look like? Um, it's shifting. You know, as the um, as the outlooks for pricing continues to again get lower and longer, uh, six months ago this chart would have looked like we needed additional processing capacity in the next two to three years. It's now pushed out to say about four to five years uh, before we're out of capacity. Again, that is on a statewide number. Um, I don't think you know, we've seen in the past challenges when we try to meet just the production level. So I think the industry is going to need to have some type of buffer built into there. And so uh, we will likely see additional expansions and projects prior uh, to the ultimate, you know, again, four to five years out. So we'll we'll need to have those projects in the queue and construction beginning probably in the next two to three years. And then on the gas transmission standpoint, it's uh, roughly the same type of time frame. So either an expansion of northern border or some type of additional transmission capacity in the region would be needed uh, again within that next four to six year window as well. And and on natural gas liquids, uh, that infrastructure uh, again has a similar about three to five year window before it needs additional expansion as well. Uh, you had mentioned four projects that are in the queue. 
can you tell us anything about those four projects? Uh, so Lynn commented uh, earlier on the um, the Sanderson project, the outrigger, um, the Hess uh, expansion, and, and um, the, a couple of the others are One Oak. Um, that's escaping me the, the exact time frame on that right now, but I can get you that information. So, so roughly how many uh, MCF are we talking about? I think it's about 800 million cubic feet per day of additional capacity. Um, you know, at the end, you were talking about what's going on with the northern border and the FERC tariff. Do you, um, I've not read up on whatever opinion ruling FERC issued. Do they have like a clear reason for why they rejected? Uh, so they rejected it um, just without, they did not have enough evidence to make a decision to accept it given the amount of opposition. Um, there was a great deal of support, a great deal of opposition, and they felt that they didn't have adequate evidence to uh, go ahead with the, the filing. So, um, but certainly they directly in the language said that if refiling it would not, there would not be any prejudice against any refilings based upon the this previous ruling. So. Okay. And then um, last question I had, um, you just alluded to the fact that sometimes winter can pose some challenges. What are the types of challenges that you might see this winter? Yeah, so uh, again, the first thing is is just winter working conditions. Anyone that, that has been in North Dakota, uh, when it gets extremely cold, the equipment doesn't want to work. People don't want to work. It's 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 tough conditions. Uh, so that that's first and foremost. Um, then you have road uh, conditions themselves just things move more slowly if there's a massive small snow amounts you need to get well sites cleared out from a gas capture perspective you know, why winter matters as the ground temperature cools um, the natural gas liquids settle out in the pipelines and the gathering systems quicker and that essentially for lack of better terms chokes the gathering pipelines and so gas that would otherwise be flowing um, is, is getting choked by liquids settling out in these cooler pipelines underground. Um, and so the, the companies need to be very diligent about picking those lines, sending tools through the, the gathering systems to keep them cleared out um, in order to move the maximum amount of gas. And then those liquids that do get cleared, you're having higher volumes and those have to be trucked away from collection points. And so if you have trucking issues, again, because of road or weather, um, that can't get to the, the collection sites. Now you have, uh, again, a scenario where trucking is holding back, you know, the gathering of natural gas. So it, it's all these things that get connected out that just make it more challenging in the winter. Is there maybe a, a better question for Lynn? What is the status of uh, attracting petrochemical industry to our state? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so again, that there's still a great deal of interest in the region. Um, I wouldn't say probably since the last time we spoke in any real big new news, uh, but I think everyone right now is just continuing to watch the industry, watch what opportunities. And again, timing is a big thing right now. Again, with any of these projects, trying to understand what the market needs, when it's going to need it, and, and what volume. So certainly the interest is still there. Uh, the opportunity for North Dakota is still very high. We still, our, our gas quality is, is still incredibly rich um, in natural gas liquids. So yeah, there's there's still a great deal of interest. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. So